section is a continuation of the basics we learned about in magnetism in the last uh, meeting. In the last class, I showed you guys, yes, I did. I showed you guys the ferromagnetic material that dictated the, or showed the, uh, the magnetic field produced by a magnet. Today, we're gonna look at a simple application of this, but we're also gonna look a little bit with electricity. So we're gonna combine electricity and magnetism today. Um, so we're gonna talk about a magnetic field produced by a wire, and then we're gonna talk about magnetic domain theory. So the first thing, and this is something that is not, uh, not something that's explained in your book, it's more stated as a fact. So I'm gonna keep it that way for now. And the simple fact is that if a wire is carrying a current, it produces a magnetic field. Okay, a wire that's carrying a current produces a magnetic field. Even if that wire has a current that's really, really small, it still produces a very small magnetic field. The more current going through the wire, like the more electricity flowing through it, the stronger the magnetic field produced. Okay, so wires that are near each other that have uh, current flowing through them could actually push or pull apart based on their magnetic field if the current is strong. Is that why they say Uh, well, in general, you don't want to put like strong magnets near electronic devices. Because it usually, it, I don't think it has to do with this specifically, but it has to do with the magnetism that would affect your electronic device. But I think it has to do with like things like the screen and the actual, um, I, don't know, I don't know about the interface, but I do know that you're absolutely right. You don't bring strong magnets near electronic devices like an iPad or anything like that. I have a mechanical watch at home. You talk about self-sprung, right? Where you actually right. have to wind it up and stuff, and as you walk, it rotates and cause. What's happening is there's a little device inside that rotates, and that device actually involves a magnet, and as it rotates, it produces some electrical charge. And I'm gonna to talk today about a simple DC motor and the idea of how to produce electric, or how to generate electricity from this. But that's what's happening. That little magnet is rotating back and forth across an uh, electrical field, and as a result, it charges the actual watch itself. I'm guessing the magnet is really strong is what affects the phone. I don't know the details of how that happens though. Uh, it's a good idea though, gratification. The, the thing we're gonna learn about is called the right hand rule. And the right hand rule tells you this. If you take your thumb and you put your right thumb, right hand, and you point it in the direction that the current is flowing through the wire, your fingers will show you the way the magnetic field is produced. So for example, if I start with a wire that's not all wound up like this, Okay, so I've got this copper wire here. By the way, there's insulation on this wire, although it looks like it's only metal. We'll talk about insulation in a minute. You take your thumb. Let's say the current is flowing out the positive terminal of the battery, goes through the wire, hits a light bulb, comes back into the battery. If the, if the current is flowing this way, I put my thumb this way and my fingers curl this way. So the magnetic field around this wire would be in this direction. In your, from your perspective, counterclockwise. Okay, if the current is traveling this way, my fingers curl this way, which means that the current or the magnetic field is around the wire, wrapped around in a counterclockwise fashion. That's what we're seeing here with the person's fingers. Now, when you look and you physically see a wire that carries the current, and notice the insulation in the middle is removed here, the actual um, compass needle also shows you the direction. If you look at all the north poles of this compass, this is really just a magnet, these are all little north poles, they're all facing in this direction, and in this case, it happens to be a counterclockwise direction. So this is what we're looking at. The current going upward, and your fingers curling around this way. The current going upward, your fingers curling around, causing a magnetic field around the wire. So this is different than what we did with the magnet, where it comes out the north end and goes back into the south end. Now we have a magnetic field that simply is concentric, I guess, technically, with the center of this, if you think of this as a diameter. All you know is that if the current goes up, it goes this way. If the current's going down, the magnetic field goes this way. So the direction that it is, is based on which way your thumb is facing or the current is facing. Now to see that, to see that, do you remember the material that was like iron chains that was in that little resin? And we put the magnet in it and showed how they would morph and change the direction or angle? Same thing is happening here. It might be tough to see from where you are, but if you look at your, your screen in front of you, you'll see that there's little circular rings 
around this wire here. The circular rings, these are just the same thing that we talked about the other day, they're just iron shavings. And when I, so when I was in high school, my teacher was, he was an engineer by trade, but he was uh, mainly an electrical engineer, so he did a lot more of electrical work than I've done. Uh, and one of the things that he did was he supplied a power, the power source would be pretty strong for this to work, by the way. So if we did it, I tried it myself, you're not going to see anything affected. So you're not going to actually see the magnetic field if you use iron shavings. What he did was he cut a hole in the table and did exactly this. Put the wire through the table. The wire was connected to a power source that gave it like 50 amps of current. And as a result, he just sprinkled iron shavings on the table. As soon as you turn on the device, you saw the iron shavings literally just line themselves up in the direction that the magnetic field is. So the idea here I want to see is that the current that's going through this wire ends up producing the magnetic field around it. That's the idea we're going to start with. We're going to apply this in a minute. But know that when a current carries a wire, there's a magnetic field as a result, okay, as a result of it. Now, the next part, and that's why this is going to loop to the video, the next part to think about is, you know what, what if this wire had a turn in it? So we start this with bending the wire first. So now if I follow this along the way, okay, follow my thumb here. So my thumb is the direction of the current. If my thumb is the direction of the current, my fingers are showing the direction of the magnetic field. So right now, the magnetic field goes around the wire like this. Again, look at the way my fingers would curl. They're showing that the direction of the field would look like this. And what will happen, though, you'll notice, is as I make this turn around the wire, follow the current, my thumb is the current. So as the current goes around the wire, and it turns around this turn here, my fingers aren't really changing at all. The magnetic field is still coming out from the loop in the wire. So the field is being produced in this direction, and yes, it curls back around, it comes back around like this, it comes back around like this, it's a circular pattern here. So as I travel through this wire, although the current is changing direction, the magnetic field produced still comes out of the center of the wire. Now if I take the same wire, and instead of having just one loop, I do this, and I put a couple loops in here, say three or four loops, what I've done now, and follow this, is I've created a looping mechanism that allows for the current to flow through this wire. And as it flows through the wire, what will happen, and I can't put my fingers in here, I'll put one finger. As my thumb, directing the current, goes through all these little wires over and over and over until it comes out all the way on this end, the magnetic field comes out of the actual gap here, of the space. So that's what we're seeing here in this diagram on the left. We're seeing that if we follow with our thumb, our fingers will always come out of the center here. Even when you turn back around and come this way, your fingers are still coming out of the center of the loop. So what happens is when you have several loops in a wire, it actually creates an effect very similar to a magnet. So this magnet has a north pole where the field comes out of and goes back into the south pole. This loop has a field coming out the top and coming back around into the bottom. It's really the same thing. They're analogous to one another. So when you create a loop in a wire, it creates an intensified magnetic field. And there's a, there's a name for this we're going to be talking about. It's called a solenoid. This device is called a solenoid. And it involves many loops all after each other. Uh, to see this, this is not the exact thing, but imagine like a spool of copper wire like this, where it's wound over and over and over again. And imagine current is going through that wire. This is what's inside of usual simple DC motors. If you look inside of like um, an AC motor, too, but if you look inside of uh, it's like a little dust buster, you know what a dust buster is? Like the little hand vacuums? Uh, if you take it apart, you'll see this little motor in there. And it was one of the projects the senior engineering class did last year. They had a project where they had to reverse engineer an item or a product. So they had to take it apart, explain how it works put it back together and like develop like a um, what's that called? A user manual to show that they know what they're doing for the project. And in the process of doing it, they notice not only did they see many power cells connected in parallel, parallel circuits that we looked at, they also saw uh, a simple electromagnet in the middle of it. And the electromagnet had tons and tons of these loops. The more loops there are, the more wire there is, the more wire there is, the stronger the magnetic field. So we're going to see this idea of a solenoid here again, is that, you know what? If the current is going through this wire, follow my fingers the way you're going to point. As the current goes up, my fingers are pointing this way. So the magnetic field comes out this end, goes back around, comes in this end. 
So this is like the north pole of the magnet, and this end is like the south pole of the magnet. So a solenoid itself is a looping of wires where a current is flowing through those wires. And as a result, these wires create a magnetic field similar to that of a magnet itself. Okay, very similar to a magnet itself. Now, let's take a look at a diagram of that exactly so you can see this a little bit better. And then I'm going to also talk about some of the characteristics of solenoids. Um, so first, what you're going to notice, if you look at the field lines, these are very much like electric field lines. The closer the spacing, the stronger the field. So inside of a solenoid, the magnetic field produced is extremely strong. Outside of it, though, it is not. So when you're looking at DC motors and things that are using magnetism, usually, <laughs> unless you usually, there's a piece of metal in the middle of here. There's a solid rod and a piece of iron. And the piece of iron, if you think back to the other day when we put the magnet inside of there and then I removed the magnet, those iron shavings, they kind of stayed where they were until I had to shake it up a little bit. The reason they stayed along that channel was because they were induced magnetism. Those little shavings from being near a magnet long enough, they started to create their own magnetic field. So what happens here is that, yeah, there's a magnetic field as a result of the solenoid, but if you put another piece of iron down the middle of it, like a bar, that iron itself becomes a magnet. So if you recall from last class, I talked about permanent magnets, and I talked about hard versus soft materials with magnetism. So when you put that piece of iron through, it's kind of like saying, you're, you're inducing it, you're putting it in a field, and over time, that iron itself, its, its domains, its magnetic domains, will realign to cause that piece of iron to not just be a regular piece of iron anymore, but to be its own magnet. So now you've got a magnet inside of a solenoid. So by putting this object inside, you're intensifying, or you're increasing, really, uh, the power that's, or the power of the magnetic field that's generated. Uh, the more coils you have, the, the density of the coils, the stronger the field. I'll, I'll jot these ones down. So magnetic field, we're not going to see this with math, but I want you to know, at least variable-wise, magnetic field is represented by B. Think out what B is measured in Tesla, and maybe I can make one Tesla. Tesla's magnetic field intensity. So the magnetic field is proportional to the amount of current going through the wire and the number of loops. And it's inversely proportional, or inversely related to the length. So really, just to give you an example, something like this with many, many, many coils over itself and it's a very short length would be a good example of something that would make a strong solenoid. If you had a longer solenoid with loops still, but they were spread out. So look at this diagram. There's a lot of room between each coil, right? So the room of space between each coil. This is a not very dense coil solenoid. Whereas if you look here, there's almost no space between each of these wire loops. So this would have a higher end value, end being the density of the loops, how close they are, how close the space they are. L is the opposite of it. It's the length of the solenoid, the less you. As the length increases, the magnetic field decreases. Okay, that's indirectly related. And again, I stands for the current in the wire. If there's more current in the wire, it's a stronger magnetic field, and as a result, this is a stronger <coughs> solenoid if there's more current. Uh, let's see. So the next term we're going to use, okay, electromagnet, is exactly what I was just referring to. So you've got some sort of a solenoid, you've got wires curled over and over and over again, you've got current flowing through the wires, and you literally do exactly that. You take a piece of ferromagnetic material and put it inside of the solenoid. And it creates an electromagnet, a much stronger electromagnet than a solenoid itself would be. And what's also interesting to note is that that piece of iron would remain magnetized because you've induced a magnetic field on the iron. And as a result, the iron elements themselves have kind of realigned themselves. We're going to see that, it's on the next slide, I think, with the diagram of what that figure looks like, where you see the magnetized fields reorient themselves so that the actual magnet has a north and south pole only. Okay, north and south pole only. Uh, recall, please, that if you have a material like iron, it's made up of a lot of little pieces of iron. So every atom itself together makes up this entire rod of iron. Well, each of these little atoms has its own orientation. 
Some of them are pointed one way, some are pointed the other way. So the polarity of this is not consistent. So this would be an unmagnetized piece of iron. As soon as you put, in this case, you set a solenoid around this thing, okay, it, and, you, and you run a current through it, so it attaches to a positive terminal, to a negative terminal, and the current flows through the wire, it will cause all of these to realign themselves, and as a result, create a magnet that looks like this where every single atom, every single particle, every single piece of this iron itself is realigned so that all the north poles act up and all the south poles are down. Or vice versa, it really doesn't matter. But the idea is that they're all aligned with each other. So the north and south poles here and the north and south here, well these two things attract each other. So that's why the other day when you saw I took out, I put it back right, that little uh, that piece of uh, magnet where it's a bunch of like little coins that look like stacked, and I was able to break it in half and say you can remove one of these. That's physically like what you're seeing here. Imagine a bunch of magnets stacked on top of each other. That's what happens when the ferromagnetic material realigns itself in the presence of a solenoid. So right now it's unmagnetized, but after enough time it is induced magnetism on the iron rod. I can now remove the iron rod and now it's really just a magnet. Okay, this is used inside of a solenoid to make it a stronger electromagnet. Yeah, I remember in like post-grading technology project, and I made like a crane, like a nail, like a wire wrapped around it. And then, and then you could pick up like paper clips. That's exactly right, Mike. The nail itself had material in it that was ferromagnetic, and that nail was this right here. That's exactly it. And you literally, you took the wire, and am I right? You like, you yeah. like tightly wrapped it around the actual nail. It's one of the, like, fundamental ways to create like a simple magnet and a simple DC motor. I'm going I'm to talk about DC motors in a second. I'll use this example. But it applies to what we're seeing here. Does how long it takes to magnet depend on the size and the Depends on several things. The mass for sure, but also remember we talked about hard or soft magnets. Soft magnetic materials can easily be made into a magnet, but they will not remain a magnet for a long time. Something that takes longer or more current, like a lot of current over time to become a magnet will hold on to its magnetism for a longer period. That's a hard magnetic material. Hard. <laughs> now, with this, if we take a look, this is a simple example which is to show you. So imagine now you've got current flowing through this wire. First of all, just so you can see up close, I know you guys can see. But on the ends, you'll see that I've shaved off part of this actual piece to show you that there's insulation on these wires. Most of I'll show you why I should present it to you to give you a little preview. Uh, if you take engineering next year, you want to see this? So this idea here is that this will spin continuously if there's something causing it to rotate. Well, if you hook up a power source to this, it'll create a magnetic, so here's the current, it'll create a magnetic field. As a result, if you put a magnet on the top and bottom, the pole up the top will cause this to want to rotate away. And then it'll hit the bottom, which will push that away. And as a result, this will continuously spin. Question somebody asked in the class was, why don't we just use that? Because it's like we don't have to worry about energy. It creates energy. It creates energy because the motor is spinning, which turns an axle. But to get this to actually work, you need to hook it up to a power source in the first place. So you're not really creating energy. You're just transforming it. You're taking an electrical current, and you're causing that to turn some sort of a motor that turns an axle, that turns something rotational. Uh, but this is the very simple way, and this was like an old science club project. One of them did it a couple of years back, where they had magnets on the top and the bottom, and they ran a current through here. And because there was a current flowing through it, there was a magnetic field produced. And the field itself, remember, if I look at it this way, the field comes out one end and back in the other. So if there's a north field coming out the side of here, and there's a magnet up here with a north pole, and they're both next to each other, this is going to want to rotate around because north north repels, so it causes it to rotate. But then on the other end, you have the same thing, causing that to push further and rotate. And eventually, it gains enough momentum so this will continuously spin. And this is like just the basics of simple you know, DC motors. There's a lot more to it than what I'm showing you here. I'm just trying to give you guys like a, uh, a synopsis or a simple overview of what you're going to see with magnetism. Uh, yeah, let's go to the last slide. So this is what I was talking about, the orientation of the domains. So on a microscopic level, this can actually be visible, first of all. You can actually see this, but you need to treat it with a certain material so you can see the magnetism. But this is showing you the orientation 
and how nothing is, al is aligned. We call each of these spots domains, like a certain region. So each, each of these regions has polarity to it. For example, this, let me point over here, this region right here has a north polarity and a south polarity. The tips of all the arrows are indicating like a north pole. If these were a bunch of little, little tiny magnets next to each other, these would all be north poles on the tip. The tail of the arrow, meaning the bottom, like here, for example, that's the actual south pole in a sense. So each of these little regions is oriented differently. So this is considered to be unmagnetized, like each of these cancel each other out, kind of. But as soon as you induce a magnetic field on it, the, the actual domains realign themselves, like this figure here on the left, so showing in your actual notes here on the right, we see, uh, by the way, on the left and then on the board here. On the right, we're going to see that these are all realigned and the north poles are all acting upward and the south poles are all on the bottom. So if I'm looking at this and I think of this as, uh, as a magnet, this is really just the north pole and this is just the south pole. Whereas for each of these little domains, they had their own north-south, north-south, north-south. Okay, Each of these had their own, but they weren't consistent. So they weren't really, uh, they were almost like they were balancing each other out, causing this material to not be magnetic. Whereas once they're realigned, and this material has an alignment in the same direction, it presents a magnetic field because of the north pole at the top and the south pole at the bottom. I'm talking a lot right now. Questions, things you're asking. I saw a hand kind of go up in the back, no? Okay. Um, let me see, I wanted to add one or two more things. You can actually calculate, so I'm, we're not going to get into this, but using, so a minute ago I talked about the fact that this was proportional to the current, the number of coils, and they're indirectly proportional to the length. Uh, in your text, if you want to, you know, take a little bit like look ahead, or if you're considering taking the subject test the physics, you want to learn more about this for that, you probably would use a math involved. There's a formula that allows you to calculate the magnetic field if you know the current, the number of loops, and the length, and there's a constant in the front here. So this would become an equation more than just a proportionality here. Uh, but recognize that we're not going to do that mathematically while you should still understand the relationship that exists amongst these, that these are directly related where this is indirectly related. B just stands for the strength of the magnetic field. Strength of the magnetic field. I think I'm going to stop there. I was going to add one more thing, but it's not something that I'm going to even test you on, and it might lead to misconceptions, so I'd rather not even talk about it. Yeah. So you have a little bit.